If you were to go to Cool Park in rural Galway, in the west of Ireland today, you could go and for a nice walk around the gardens, see where the stately house once, once uh, was, and you'll probably be easily pointed to it. There is a tree where there are 13 famous writers have all carved their name in. What the poor tree did to deserve that, I don't know. But for those of us who like a good writer, for those of us who have respect and admiration for people of a certain generation who wrote and wrote beautifully, this is an exciting time or an exciting place to visit at least. Three Nobel Prize winners and essentially beyond them, the foundation of modern Irish theatre. Cool Park was the ancestral home and the home of a woman called Lady Augusta Gregory growing up. She grew up there in a landed gentry house. She was a member of the Protestant Ascendancy, which is an important term to, learn, to be familiar with because the Protestant Ascendancy are the people who basically ran Ireland for years. Uh, not of the same religion as the majority, but generally more educated uh, and a higher standing in the, local, in the uh, national society. Lady Gregory, despite being brought up in the very best possible manner, uh, as a good, uh, good Protestant stock, spent most of her time hanging around with the servants. And it was there that she got a flavour for what it was to be Irish and the rhythms of the local people as they spoke. We'll see that later. She became an important figure in the founding of the Abbey Theatre, the preeminent literary focal point of Irish society for many generations. And as a woman with a very nice house uh, and a good place away in the country to visit, many's the time that famous writers uh, would come and visit her there. And at a certain point, she decided she'd have them all write on uh, or inscribe their names on that uh, tree. We had a revolution and we had a, a civil war and we uh, took, up, took back Ireland to ourselves, we the Irish. She was no less Irish than any of us, nor were many of the Protestant ascendancy. But in the fervour of getting rid of the Brits, Cool Park, the house there, was knocked down. Fortunately for us, we still see that tree. Cool Park was one of many stately homes that the landed gentry, the Protestant ascendancy, and in some cases the Catholic ascendancy, would meet and gather. It was at a place also in Galway called Tillyra, where owned by a gentleman by the name of Edward Martin, that a famous meeting was to take place in 1896. William Butler Yeats, a poet, a man at this stage who had a great interest in all things, um, all things to do with uh, nationalism in Ireland, and that same Lady Gregory, were introduced to each other by Ed Martin. Martin had been a bit of a writer and had some strongish nationalist feelings in spite of his upbringing. And he felt that these two were a good match, that they should meet. Within two to three years, they'd, the three of them had founded the Irish uh, Literary uh, Theatre. The Irish Literary Theatre ran for a couple of years, but didn't really take off. Uh, it was disabled by the fact that, for the most part, the actors were not Irish, nor were the plays for the most part. But this was where the Abbey Theatre began to become a thing. Uh, it's very easy to put these into a linear setup. Lots of things were happening. As I mentioned the last day, we had a lot of sort of literary revivals going on at the time. The literary revivals including uh, one in the Irish language and one in, um, in their sports and so many different kinds of revivals of what it was to be Irish, what it was to be Celtic. Those are two different things. William Butler Yeats had already, as a poet, been writing and working towards helping to develop an idea of an Irish idiom. He had been collecting folklore and fairy tales and had written many, many of them up. You can still get his books of fairy tales if you look out for them. Lady Gregory had been uh, also collecting folklore and stories and putting them together. Both had an eye for the theatre, and when they had the chance to work together, they started to create plays. Initially, 
Yates's ego was not, let's say, overwhelmed by his talent. He needed help. And Lady Gregory was probably the first person to really take him in hand and teach him a little bit about the basics of playwriting. Yeats had become very much turned on to the idea of the nationalism and the Irish uh, and the Celtic revival, thanks to uh, meeting a lady, an English lady called Maud Gonne. Maud Gonne, in turn, was a major figure in terms of um, an aspirational leader for Ireland and uh, independence. These three had some success with the Irish Literary Theatre. There, there was interest, but it wasn't really Irish. Uh, they found a very useful gentleman by the name of Willie Fay. Him and his brother Frank had been uh, working together. Willie or William W.G. Fay, as he's generally depicted, had been an, a director, an actor, a trainer of all things. And he had traveled around quite a deal around Britain and Ireland as an actor. His brother Frank was not completely incapable either. <clears throat> and when the two of them met with uh, Yeats and Gregory, it was the beginning of something. More figures were added into the midst. J.M. Singh, a poet uh, in, and translator in the making, who was, again, not what you would call Catholic Irish. He was an interested figure and Yeats saw in him great potential. Together, him, Yeats, Gregory, and a guy who was known by as uh, A.E., George Russell, uh, together they became the first board of what they were calling the Irish Nation the National Theatre Society. They needed to uh, pick up together a few more people. And it gets kind of fuzzy and interesting here. At this point, a lot of a lot there were a lot of Irish people who were working in Britain. And so again, pulling back Willie Fay uh, and others was a key thing. They got in contact with George Bernard Shaw and had him as a figure who was uh, key. Uh, although he very seldom produced what they needed, they had him on um, they had him on a retainer practically. Very, very importantly, they found a woman called Annie Horniman. Now, Annie Horniman was a British, an English woman, I think from around Manchester, and she had some previous experience with producing a play when she produced Arms and the Man with George Bernard Shaw. So she has the connection already. Shaw was always, always, always a very proud Irishman. At this stage, Oscar Wilde, who never really played anything of his Irishness, had sort of drifted off the scene. We will come back to him in a later episode. So Horniman had a feel for the Irish, supposedly, but most importantly, she had money, theatrical interest, and at the time, goodwill. She it was who ultimately is the key figure in developing the Abbey. Not an Irish person by any means, but she was happy to lend money and be, uh, so to speak, the uh, legal face of the company. Yeats and many of the others involved were very keen for a very nationalist theatre, a theatre that uh, was not shy to uh, be political. Horniman said no. The young woman said no repeatedly to many of uh, the requests and, and the demands. And so, to Yeats's disappointment and the disappointment of others, it starts off being a, a theatre that avoids the political to some degree. That changes with time. So we have Annie Horniman in place. She's uh, signing the paper. She's giving over the money. She's signing the papers. But it's also very important to note that she's not there. She's living in England. She puts them in contact with uh, lots of good people, but it's Lady Gregory who signs the papers. Lady Gregory, in effect, is the person who runs the theatre. Now, the person who's actually running the actual organisation of everything else, really, at, for the first set four years, is Willie Fay. He was a director, actor, trainer, uh, theatre manager, the whole works, and he had experience. But if you look at the board, and the boards as they went on for years, they were very much led by writers, which gave the Abbey the... Uh, 
the reputation of being a theater of writers. And it's very true. In these early years, many of the early, uh, many of the early plays are still studied from a literary point of view. The first night was in 1904. The Mechanics Theatre on the corner of Abbey Street and Marlborough Street in Dublin had been uh, rented by Annie Horniman, again through Lady Gregory, and it was as was the building beside it, which had been a morgue. It was uh, got first in 1903 and Willie Fay and co set about the tough business of turning it into a functioning theatre. It had been used for music hall and such likes for years, but this needed a refit. Now it's important before we even get to that first night's play, those first nights of play in on the 27th of December, 1904. Before ever we get to that, we need to know what the theater dimensions were. So it was a good sized theater, but unfortunately there was no direct access uh, from the way they had things set up. It should have been on Abbey Street, but the uh, theater doors were practically impractical for getting to where the actual theater as they had rebuilt it was. The theatre itself it was a goodly sized auditorium, but the stage makes a huge difference on Irish theatre to this day. That stage was approximately two metres, two yards, six feet, something like that, deep. So from the front of the stage where the audience is to the back of the stage where there's simply a wall, you have six feet. It is 10 uh, metres wide, roughly 30 feet. 30 feet by six, which means you've got a long, a long, narrow space, very narrow space, which influences the style of acting. We'll get onto that in a little bit. The opening night was uh, five nights of three short plays. Um, the first night was On Balia Strand by Yeats, Spreading the News by Lady Augusta Gregory, and Kathleen Nihulahan, which was by Yates and Gregory together. And uh, it alternated every other night, that trio, with the same lineup, except instead of Kathleen Nihulahan, it was In the Shadow of the Glen by J.M. Singh. It is said that the first person on stage was Frank Fay, Willie's brother, who was playing the part of Cú Cullen in On Balia Strand. Read on Strand, and you'll know that Cucullin is by no means one of the first people on stage. In fact, if anything, we need him off stage. So again, we go back to our his history, taking on special terms in order for us to create our, our um, cre uh, to give our creation myth. Thus ends part one of this uh, episode on the Abbey Theatre. I had hoped to get through all of it in about 20 to 22 minutes, but there's just too much to try and get through. So please accept uh, my apology for my hubris and look up uh, part two shortly. Mm -hmm.